Hey everybody, this is Tierra Shea with Insert Burger Pun, and we are back with a new episode. Today we're going to be talking about um, Season 2, Episode 1, called The Belchies. Why are we talking about this? Because I went to go see The Goonies recently on the beach with some friends. It was a free movie, so I was like, hell yeah, free movie, let's do it. And I remembered how much I loved The Goonies as a movie. I haven't seen it in a really long time, and it immediately made me think about the Bob's Burgers episode, and so I... Woke up this morning and was like, we're going to record it. So the pajamas and the bonnet are going to stay on for the duration of this. But yeah, let's talk about the show. So we're talking about season two of Bob's Burgers episode one, the season premiere. It came out uh, March 11th, 2012. Whereas the movie The Goonies came out in uh, 1985 starring Sean Astin, a.k.a. Samwise and Corey Feldman, which is the Corey that's still alive. The plot of the episode is that Teddy tells a story of hidden treasure inside an abandoned taffy factory that is about to be demolished. So the kids decide to sneak out and look for treasure. Meanwhile, Bob and Linda have scheduled sex, have a scheduled sex night and Linda attempts to make it special by having games and sneaking Bob an enlargement pill. And this is the plot to the Goonies movie. A group of misfits called the Goonies discover an ancient map and set out on an adventure to find legendary pirates, find a legendary pirate's long lost treasure. So we're not that far off in terms of plot. There is no sex uh, scheduled sex night, because if I remember correctly in the Goonies, either the dad is dead or the dad is too busy to do things. I think he might be dead. And the mom has a broken like collarbone she's like in a sling the entire movie so they're not having a scheduled sex night only bob and linda are doing that um but yeah i got really really inspired to to record this episode because watching the movie i was like wait this is a pretty interesting film mike uh my co-host he's not here obviously but he also is not really a big fan of the movie the goonies but i did want to make sure that i recorded something about it the thing that made me think about it was uh, as I'm watching, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this gets really close to a lot of child murder in the Goonies because the adults are the um, what's it called? They are the antagonists of the film are are three adults and they are just pursuing these oops, pursuing these children and with full intention of killing them. And I'm like, ah, that is a little dicey, ah, dicey sex dice. We'll get there. But speak, yeah, speaking of which, it turns out, I guess, Bob's Burgers just went in a different direction in term, terms of the criminal activity. And that is with Bob and Linda. I was going to get into it a little bit later, but I we might as well talk about it now. There is a, an aspect of this episode that does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable. And like they laugh it off and it's like a ha 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 joke. But um in addition to like the sex dice and things that Bob and Linda are trying to do for their scheduled sex night, Linda also makes the decision to slip Bob a, a, a penis enlarger or not a penis enlarger pill, but I would say like a Viagra, like some a st- like something that's gonna help his penis stay up for sex and more sex. And um, yeah, they want she wants to keep the party going. I think she says something like. Uh, sometimes you want to ride the roller coaster twice when, and I don't want to wait in line. And it's, it's a joke, you know, it's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be taken in a, in a, um, a funny light, but it, I do find, it does make me a little uncomfortable because it's, that is sexual assault. <laughs> and even if it, it's sexual assault against, uh, your spouse, it's still like that there is the marital aspect of it, but it's still sexual assault. But you also have to remember that seasons one and two are made and in a way that are completely different than the show is now. It's way more family friendly. It's way more, you know, I mean, they're singing every episode nowadays, but seasons one and two definitely had more of a different and more adult style of humor. So I do, I am taking that in consideration, but I do not condole sexual assault. Please don't sexually assault people. Please do not spike people's drinks. It's not nice. It's not right. And it's definitely illegal. So, hey, if you want to be a pill-popping sex freak, that's a quote. That's not me calling anybody anything. But if you want to be a pill-popping sex freak, you can. Just make sure that everybody is consenting in doing that. End of lesson. (laughs) 
All right, let's get into the episode, though. So I don't think I'm going to be doing a side character showcase for this episode just because it's very early on. It's the second season. It's the first episode of the second season. So if you weren't in the first season, you haven't you you like don't exist yet. Like it's very early new characters. But um, for side character showcase, I was either going to do Zeke or Dennis, which are two characters that we are introduced to for the first time. And it's so wild because Zeke is such a character that I, I love him so much. I feel like he's always been there. And so now knowing that season two, episode one is his first episode that he's around. I'm like, wait, hasn't he just been around? And that's just because he's so popular and uh apparent in later seasons and later episodes that season two is the first time we meet him he's nowhere in season one and then Dennis oh wait I'm not done talking about Zeke okay uh, I also noted here that I thought it was hilarious that the first thing that we see Zeke doing is wrestling with Jimmy Jr. on the beach and I believe one of his first lines is Jimmy Jr. put me in a crotch lock and see if I can get out of it from the get he's just giving off really really strong bisexual energy which I enjoy and I think that's pretty hot so yeah the first thing we hear him say is for Jimmy Jr. to you know shoot for his crotch and so that he could tussle on out I really enjoy that that's the first time we meet Zeke and he's direct competition for Tina who is fighting for Jimmy Jr.'s affection I don't think he had Which now, actually thinking back in season one, you didn't see Zeke around. Whenever Jimmy Jr. was talked about or Tina, if he she interacted with Jimmy Jr. Wait, no. What? What? Oh, because that's the second season. That's the second season that we get Tammy. Okay. Yep. Never mind. I was going to say, don't we? Doesn't Tammy meet Zeke? But yeah, so Zeke is direct competition for Jimmy Jr. I think in the first season, if we ever did see Jimmy Jr. and Tina together, it was just him or he was at the Pesto's place. So he never really had anybody else to distract uh, him from Tina. So now that Zeke's around, that's when we start having Jimmy Jr. being more like, oh, Tina, I'm too busy. I can't. I'm, I, I'm trying to hang out with my boyfriend, my, my male friend. So now that's the, this episode's the introduction to Zeke. It's also the introduction to Dennis, which is a lesser known character. He would be more he would be more considered to be a side character. But I did recognize him and I was like, isn't that that one guy from Full Bars? And it is. He is the character from Full Bars, which is the Halloween episode of season three. And he's the guy who backs the truck in and parks it and then drops the the thing down on the on the boxes and locks the kids inside and is like on the phone and he's always he's always on the phone at work because he's on the phone in this episode as well talking about Teddy. Oh, I bet he was on his way to Teddy's um, Halloween party because he was commenting um, in this episode about how a friend of his had a a bean a bean party or like a a, a layered bean party, but it was bring your own bean. So layer like layered salsa bean or whatever. And he was upset about that. He's like, who does that? Who has a bring your own bean party? Can I put you down for garbanzo? On both occasions, his lack of effort puts people in direct possibility of death. I guess you could say maybe he's not very good at his job. In full bars, he is on the phone. He's wearing the Carmen Miranda outfit with the fruit on his head. And he, you know, doesn't tell, he doesn't look behind him to see if there's anybody there. He doesn't hear the kids screaming because he's on the phone. And he accidentally drops the back part of his truck on top of, I need to stop moving my hands around. My camera's having a hard time catching up. But he drops his uh, the thing down uh, on the box and almost crushes them. And then in this episode, definitely... The stakes are a lot higher on this, and he's definitely open to a lawsuit. He tells his boss that he checked the building twice to make sure that there was no one inside before they start using the wrecking balls to knock down the building. He did not, because obviously we have all of our main characters inside of the building trying not to be killed. But let's just think about it for a second. If they did die and they were inside lawsuit is a lawsuit available or would that be something that because they were technically trespassing and like broke through the gate that they're not liable for somebody dying inside i'll look that up later maybe not 
but it's just food for thought. I guess that's my side character showcase is the introduction to Dennis, who we will later see in full bars in the next season, and then Zeke, who we will see forevermore. Okay, so let's talk about what actually happens in the episode. In terms of the warehouse, what what goes on at the factory? So they all sneak out, the three kids sneak out, but unbeknownst to everybody, Tina also invites Jimmy Jr. Jimmy Jr. also invites Zeke, and Andy and Ollie just show up because... You know, there is an Easter egg that I found out online. So thank you, Reddit, for this. But at the 40, four minute, about four minutes and 40 seconds in, I was really hoping it was going to be 420. But it wasn't. It was like around the 440 mark. Jimmy Jr. is riding his bike up the or like down to meet them. And there is a scene. I'll put it up. But there is a scene. If you look at the top left, you'll see uh, a sign that says Fratelli's and Son. And I thought that was so cute because our main antagonists in the uh, the Goonies are the Fratelli family. So the fr- the mother and then the two sons. Ah? So that's something that I found out. I did not know that they did that. That was a di- that's obviously a direct nod to the Goonies. And the factory itself is called the Caffery Caffery Factory. I'm not sure if that's related to the Goonies in any way, but they did have just like a flash of direct Goonie reference i guess you can say in that brief moment but so yeah so they all get there some are uninvited some are invited they get in they do the classic abandoned warehouse stuff where they're just breaking glasses having fun jimmy jr's having his fit footloose moment and zeke is cheering him on he's like yeah abandoned warehouse pent up feelings footloose it and jimmy jr does the line that i loved I, I, this episode is very quotable for me highly quotable moments that i think about often my one of my uh go-tos is when jimmy jr is like don't tell me not to dance dad that's good stuff good cinema because that's a that's a theme throughout the rest of the show is that uh jimmy pesto does not accept jimmy jr's dancing and jimmy jr loves to dance we know we know I'm waiting for the Footloose episode that they're, they should do. I guess they did butt loose, but I would love a more Jimmy Jr. centric episode about him dancing and it make it more about Footloose and stuff like that. So who finds the first clue? Gene finds the first clue because him and Andy and Ollie are like licking on stuff, which hello tetanus. Hopefully they've had their shots. I doubt it just because of the, they don't seem the type that would keep up to date on doctor checkups and things like that. Who knows? I'm not calling them bad parents, but I'm just saying that based off what I've seen of the show, I don't, I can't confidently say that those kids have had their tetanus shots. So they are looking and they find an abandoned elevator. The, you know, they hop right in, but then they break the elevator And Louise is pissed at this point. She's like, you invited people that I said that when we didn't say we were inviting people because she's right. The more people you bring on a a treasure hunt is the more you have to break up the treasure finding. So the less people you bring, the less you have to split up. So and I'm all about saving money and and keeping keeping the wealth. So not (laughs) whatever. I'm not selfish. So um, when they break the elevator, there's like a little hole. So Louise Andy and Ollie pop on out because they're tiny and they leave the average size humans in the elevator that's broken and just try to go off on their own and do their own adventure and find the treasure. But of course, Louise kind of, I, I, I don't want to say that I would be Louise in this episode, but she does a lot of things that I think that I would do if I were in that situation. So she has Andy, one of the twins be in front of her, one in back. And I'm like, if I'm ever in a situation like a treasure hunt where I know booby traps are a thing, maybe I would have a human shield in the front and back. Hopefully it wouldn't be with people that I enjoy. And, you know, I don't want anybody to get hurt, but it is smart to have a human shield on the front and back when going through booby trapped infested areas. That's just me. That's just my opinion. And that's my encouragement to you. And if you ask me to be a human shield for you, I'll probably say no, but you can't fault me for that. (laughs) So while she's walking around with the twins, even though she has the front and back human shields going on, the, the booby trap that's set off actually hits her in the middle and knocks her to the side and down a shaft. 
And down there, she meets one of the terracotta warriors, a.k.a. the Taff monster man that the guy, the Taffy man, had made as guards for the treasure. And so she's stuck down there. So we'll leave her down there for a little bit. Back up with the uh, the average size kids. Tina is trying to use a Roma of romance, a romance novel that she found on the beach to woo or to seduce and get some alone time with Jimmy Jr. That was her plan when she invited him to to do the expedition was for her to use the book to spend more time with him and be in a situation where, oh, where's a big strong man here to protect me? I'll be a damsel in distress and you'll rescue me. But Jimmy Jr.'s too invested in Zeke and making sure that Zeke's having a good time and showing that he's like a badass and, and Jimmy Jr.'s like, not interested, I'm, I'm good. Oh, the other part that I enjoyed about this whole Jimmy Jr. Tina thing is that Gene, Gene flat out tells Tina, he says, Tina, honey, Jimmy Jr. is not into you, period. Gene, Gene hit the nail on the head and was just like, dude, he's not into you. It's clear. I'm here. I'm, I'm seeing the vibes. I'm not picking up any vibes that he's into you. Gene's just chilling. He doesn't want to move. It took him five minutes to cross his legs. He's just going to stay in that elevator until somebody comes and gets him. I do want to note <laughs> that the name of the book that uh, Tina is using is called The Darkest Crevice, which I thought was really neat and funny. And it was written by Naomi Saban. Saban? And that, I guess, is the maiden name of the TV producer, Naomi Scott. So reference there. So Bob and Linda use Tina's diary. I'm not sure if this is the first time in the series, again, because it's very early at season two. But they use, I don't know if this is the first time that they've used Tina's journal to find out what the kids are doing. But Bob reads it out loud. And it has one of my favorite quotes where if, Boys have, if boys had uteruses, they'd be called deuteruses. And it makes Bob laugh the same way it made me laugh. Just one of those <laughs> things, deuteruses. Because it's true. If they did have uteruses, they maybe would be called deuteruses. And if not, we're really missing out on an opportunity. <laughs> deuteruses. Uh, another part that I enjoyed at the beginning before we're even at the warehouse is when they, when Luis was trying to validate the map that that Teddy had made for them because it was in the shape of a butt with like three little plops of poop. And she's like, well, what if somebody, if you were to be able to make a map out of any shape, if you were to make a treasure map, any shape, what would you make it? And all three of them said, but, and it made me think, I'm like, what shape would I would, would I want to make it? And I would say either a, a butt. I like the idea of making it the shape of anatomy or like a body part. I would want to make it into the shape of something that people would look at it and go, oh, that's not real. That can't be real. So I'm not going to go for it. The same. It happened in this. So I'd probably go with but, uh, butt, boobs, um, maybe a penis. And then if I really, really wanted to fuck with some people, I would make it into the shape of the female reproductive system. The whole system, fallopian tubes included, the ovaries included. They're just going to go all over the place trying to find my treasure which <laughs> could be the same thing that's a sex joke <laughs> so while the kids are stuck in the warehouse doing all the warehouse stuff bob and linda are at the house trying to get their sexy time on uh linda introduces some sex dice which i will put someone thankfully put the combinations of all of the the possibilities there's 25 possible outcomes for the dice to roll on for the sex dice a lot of the time i guess it landed on lick foot which we now know is not one of bob's kinks <gasps> lick it like you like it no no more lick foot no more lick foot there's no kink shaming allowed on this podcast so if you like to lick fit feet if you like to touch feet if you like to do anything with feet that's fine by me no kink shaming, but we do know now that that's not his jam. He's not a big fan. He's not, he doesn't have a foot fetish. <laughs> Maybe Linda does, but Bob does not. And um, they read the diary and they, they get on out of there trying to find the kids. And Bob has his, his boner that just won't go away because he's, he was drugged by his wife, which we, we already talked about is not okay. Do not do that. But it does make for some funny jokes about how, um, 
Linda says, oh, that penis helped make the kids. Maybe it could find them. And asks, she's like, where are they? Where are they, girl? And his penis, I've never named, I've never named a penis before, or I've never named a consistent penis. I've never been married. Let's just start there. I've never married. I've never named my husband's penis. We'll say that. And she says, yeah, your penis is a pretty brunette. I am I guess we're including pubes. Uh, a pretty brunette, just like uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones, who is a beautiful woman. She's stunning. So if I had a penis and somebody named it, I would hope that they would name it in reference to Catherine Zeta-Jones because she's gorgeous. So I'll take it. It's a compliment. Um, so they're in there. They meet up with Tina and uh, Jean very quickly because they're already yelling in the in the warehouse in the factory uh trying to test out the acoustics because gene's having a moment he's having several moments in this factory where he just can't stop hitting things with a brick and trying to find like a beat and trying to find the correct beat and just knocking on things and so they hear that and meet up with them and they see jimmy jr zeke and the twins stuck in a booby trap just hanging out cut them down and meanwhile one of my most, the most memorable and favorite parts of the entire episode is Luis being down in the shaft with Taffy or Taff, the, the like monster guy. So let's pick up where she was. We dropped her off in the shaft. She's still down there because it's a shaft. And she makes a friend who I think is probably the equivalent of Sloth in The Goonies, where he's just kind of like this character. That was terrible of me to do. This character and Louise befriends Taff because she has no one else to talk to. She's really upset with her family. She really kind of the equivalent of cussed out her family before leaving and ditching them. Uh, Jean says she ditched us and she ditched us some more. Yeah, Louise is like pretty outbursty in this episode. Like she calls her family like useless she calls them like dead weight and she blames all of the issues of the night on her family and ditches them more than once and i've been ditched more than once before in one sitting and it does suck (laughs) yeah all of her exchanges with taff in that shaft i think are like my favorite part of the entire episode like the whole whoa big news taff is upset everybody gather around I love that line. I love all of the exchange. They have like a whole montage of like how their friendships progressing as everybody else is doing the stuff in the the factory and things like that. That is a really good exchange. It's one of my favorites where she just gangs a candy friend, I guess you could say. Oh my gosh. Well, I totally even forgot. Even so when Bob and um, Bob and Linda, when Bob and Linda find the rest of the kids, they're trying to find Louise and they're like, oh, she's in this shaft. And Bob asks Louise, like, are you sure there's nothing down there? She's like, oh, well, I forgot a grappling hook. Oh, wait, here's a grappling hook. Oh, and here's an escalator. Really me. Christian Shaw, the voice of Louise, also being the voice of Mabel Pines, I think is her last name, in Gravity Falls. And her character, Mabel, has a grappling hook a lot. And I will have a grappling hook. So I was like, maybe they're uh, doing something for that. But I don't know. And uh, Bob asks if she wants her last words to be sarcastic. And she says, no. We're about to die, Louise. Do you really want your last words to be sarcastic? No. Which I relate to. But somehow Louise is able to get out of the shaft. I think they make a, a human ladder. Very a la Ants, the movie Ants. By making a ladder. A ladder. They do one of those and pull her out. She asks, she's like, we're taking Taff with us. Let's get on out of here. And he's like stuck to Bob's boner, which is hilarious. So they're running out. Dennis almost murders them by telling his boss, oh, yeah, I already double checked. I, I checked it twice. There's no one in there. It's all good. Let's start the demolition. You, sir, are a liar. And there's people inside. So... They make it out at the last second, thank goodness. And then Luis, it, it basically is, it becomes the ending portion of the Goonies where they're all reunited with every with their loved one. And um, Luis does the thing where she's like, oh, Taff, you're going to live with me now. The line that Chuck's, uh, Chunk says. And uh, Linda's like, nah, dude, we're getting rid of that. And I love that because in the Goonies, I was like, um, 
you never really asked your parents whether or not you could bring home this man, this, I don't, we don't even know how old Sloth is. Not saying that you shouldn't adopt people, but don't, as a child, you're not allowed to say, hey, you're going to come home with me and we're going to take care of you because you're not taking care of yourself. Your parents are taking care of you, or at least, you know, they should be taking care of you. <laughs> you're going to live with me now. I'm going to take care of you because <laughs> I love you. You're not taking that filthy thing home. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was the most realistic answer that Lin that Linda gave. But then, this is the part that pisses me off, is that after the fact, we find out, we find out that there's gold inside of Taffy, but by then, it gets washed away. And we're not even going to talk about the fact that gold weighs more, and I think that it would have sunk down to the bottom of the ocean. I'm not sure if gold bars can be washed out to sea by just the gentle waves that crash ashore, but... I guess for the sake of frustration, let's say it did. But my goodness, what a frustrating episode because we don't know how many gold bars were inside of Taffy. And if that's the case, how heavy was he carrying him out? Like that must he must have been incredibly heavy because gold weighs a lot. I don't know. I'm trying to think of like other episodes where they have opportunities to win a lot of money. So I think indecent, like indecent uh, Thanksgiving proposal when it's a few months of rent, that's a few thousand dollars, probably maybe a few, maybe like five grand, but gold bars. I don't know how much they're, they're worth. Let me actually look it up. One hour later. Five hours later. Okay, so a few, so gold bars are worth a few thousand dollars each. And so if there were a few of those inside of Taff, they would have been set for a little bit. They would have not had to pay rent. Bob could have bought all of his expensive um, ingredients that he likes to buy for some reason. I mean, the song is right. They didn't look inside of Taffy. They didn't look inside the Taffy butt. And speaking of Taffy Butt, I love the song. I love the song. I love the Goonie song already because I'm a big Cyndi Lauper fan. She's the best. She's she's so cool. And so to hear to know that she did, you know, the song for the Goonies, of course, whatever. But she also, you know, they were able to get her to do the song for Bob's Burgers as well. Like, that's amazing. They had her do Taffy Butt, the Taff. I wonder if I can get copyright for doing that. I don't know. Taffy Butt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so good. It's so good. I love it so much. That's a, It was a good episode. I'm glad I watched it. I gl I'm glad I watched The Goonies. If you haven't watched The Goonies in a while and you haven't seen it at all, maybe maybe give it a give it a good old watch. I'm not saying it's the best movie out there because there is a lot of questionable themes and <laughs> some some child violence. But other than that, it has a really good nostalgic qualities. And I think that the creators of Bob's Burgers knew that. And so they're like the first episode back for second season we should you know tug on the heartstrings of of the people who uh remember goonies and love it and they'll watch it and enjoy it and stick with the rest of the season who knows and also i might be doing a follow-up video for this because as i was making my notes for this video one of the things i realized that would be fun would be to cast out the goonies movie and like the whole because the episode wasn't it didn't go as goonies as it could have at least in my opinion i think that because there are so many kids in bob's burger in the bob's burger universe that they had an opportunity to like really just do the whole goonies movie with the Bob's Burgers characters and they didn't. And so I thought it'd be really fun to do that myself and just cast it and try to see if that works or not. I'll probably talk more about the trivia of uh, the Goonies movie itself in that video rather than this one, because I don't want it to go too long. Um, but did you guys know that this this episode, the season premiere for the second season of Bob's Burgers, pulled in 4.4 million views, which even though they got positive reviews for the episode, it was still bad because the first season they got like 9.38 9 million. So that was, they, we got less than half of the returning people for the second season. So even though it's what like it's one of my favorites and very popular in my head i guess it didn't do very well when it first came out so that's that's very interesting to know um, also, ne uh, Las Vegas is not the capital of Nevada. I don't live in Nevada, but I do know that it's Carson City. And I think either Andy or Ollie is the one trying to say, say all the capitals. And he's like, don't tell anyone when Luis <laughs> reminds him that Las Vegas is not the capital of Nevada. How did I not say booby trap a bazillion times in this episode? I think I said it maybe once. What's wrong with me? 
Oh, yeah. With Okay, so there's a scene in the episode where Bob is, like, laying seductively on the bed waiting for Linda to get in so they can go to Pound Town. But the, the, the pose that he's doing on the bed waiting for Linda is almost identical to the pose that Burt Reynolds, who I, I think that the people at Bob's Burgers must just be obsessed with Burt Reynolds and Tom Selleck, for sure, because those two get referenced to a lot in the show. But in 1972, there's a Cosmopolitan centerfold with a nude Burt Reynolds splayed across and had just one hand here and just, you know, chilling. And I thought it was great because as I was doing research on that photo and like how that went, there's a lot of regret in Burt Reynolds' life regarding that photo shoot. And he wishes he didn't do it. He says, I was so drunk when I did it. I was plastered. I had been drinking all day and I just threw my robe off and was like, fuck it, let's do it. Let's take some nudie pictures. And now he has made the comment that after that photo shoot was done, that people cared more about his pubes than his his art and his and his um his acting and things like that. Which may be true. Who knows? I, I might be more interested in his pubes than his work as well. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Insert Burger Pun. Always a pleasure to be doing these and talking to you guys. And I can't wait for the next one. Until then, stay out of my room. Up in the